for the past few years, we've been talking, especially at the forum, actually, uh, about this, the need to include more people into, our, uh, into facing the challenges we, we, we must face. Uh, and so it's not only about government anymore, it's not only even about a, a particular firm, but rather we need to work with all our competitors in an industry, and we need to work with government, and we need to work uh, with, with uh, you know, employees, but also with you know, unions, uh, with stakeholders across society around environmental issues, social issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When, when you talk about these big paradigms and how these different mountains have all these different uh, meanings and, and symbolize different things, but also can illuminate or give you insight into our own leadership. Uh, how do you see f that fit into this, this trend, this, this multi-stakeholder, you know, multi this managing different, different aspects of leadership at the same time while trying to pursue our own goals? H how do you see that fit into this uh, kind of trendy? Uh, uh, of being more inclusive and taking into account. Yeah. Well, for example, in Latin America, you have a number of different cultures. There are, of course, the various uh, pre-Columbian cultures that continue with the Quechua-speaking people, the Aymara people, people in the Selva. And then you have the overlay, of course, the European, Spanish, Portuguese, and then immigrants from many parts of the world. For example, here in Peru, recent president Alberto Fujimori was the son of Japanese immigrants. So there's really a, a much broader spectrum of cultures here. And if you look at mountains, in each of these cultures, uh, they, reveal, uh, they, they reveal things that are important and different ways of thinking. So what you need to do is develop a flexibility of leadership that becomes more inclusive and that's adapted to the particular people that you're working with. In addition to which, if you're doing uh, business abroad, of course you have to deal with people in other cultures, but even running a business or a corporation here in Latin America, you're gonna have people from different cultures. And so how do you bring them in? And becoming familiar with different leadership styles that are reflected in these different mountains can play a really critical role in enabling you to be more inclusive and more effective in your leadership. In your, in your metaphors with, mm -hmm. with peaks, would you share some of them with us? Because I thought when I was reading and we were talking before, uh -huh. uh, it was quite insightful. And, and I hadn't thought of mountains in that way. Uh, but okay. it was very useful to kind of uh, use them as, as, as uh, kind of beacons of things we, want, we may oh, want to okay. pursue. Well, to begin with, uh, you automatically have a flexibility. Uh, one of the things I often say is, let's say you're very high on a mountain like Everest and a storm comes in, a blizzard. What kind of leadership do you want? Do you want somebody to build consensus? It's not the time to be doing that. <laughs> if you do that, you'll die. <laughs> what you want is somebody to take over with command and control and say, let's get down. <laughs> On the other hand, when you're at base camp, when it's warm and you've got plenty of time, that's the place to build consensus. So immediately you see flexibility of styles. So I start off with the obvious paradigm, which is Mount Everest, which is you know, the highest peak, being number one, very important in Western culture, and also the idea of setting and attaining motivational goals and the logistics required for that. And I look at two different ways to climb a mountain like Everest. One is what's called the siege style, modeled on the military with a large operation, a lot of logistics. Then there's something called alpine style, where a small group of very good climbers moves very quickly up the mountain. There are pros and cons of each, and they correspond to a large scale operation, often command and control of a large company with a mature product, whereas the alpine style is more the entrepreneurial startup or what's called the skunk work small operation that develops a new product within a large, larger company. For example, the way the Macintosh computer was developed within Apple. But then I'll ask you a question which leads to another paradigm. Who would you say is the most famous and influential mountain climber in Western history? Well, and you know, you know my answer, but my, my thought was uh, the, the guy who climbed uh, Everest first. Yeah, usually people will say that was Sir my, Edmund that Hillary. Was my it's Sir Edmund Hillary whom I, right. I used to be on the board with, and he's very, was very, well, he's unfortunately passed away, very interesting person. But I would say much more influential, much more famous in Western history is Moses from the Bible. And if you look at the story of his account, whether or not he actually climbed the mountain, what's important is the story. That's what's had the influence historically and which serves as a model for us. And we often think of mountain climbing as conquering a mountain. But in the case of Sinai, there's no conquest. What happens is Moses is called to go up on the mountain. He climbs to the top. That's where the meeting place of heaven and earth, so to speak. There he receives something of great value, the Ten Commandments and the first five books of the Bible, and he takes them back down for the benefit of the people 
and in the process transforms a whole people and develops the Jewish religion. So that becomes a paradigm for the role of a leader in instilling a sense of calling, service, vocation, and transforming an organization. And that's not so much directed as the bottom line, which of course is important, but other things that are very important, especially for younger people here in Latin America, which is how do you develop a sense of meaning and values that will help you to transform society as well as make a profit. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another. Then uh, another uh, example which I've mentioned is Mount Fuji, yeah. which of course is a symbol of corporate culture and how you develop identity and teamwork. And then uh, a paradigm I have that uh, applies right here to Peru is Machu Picchu. So Machu Picchu is an iconic mountain, of course, for Peru and for Latin America. So in a sense, functions a little like Fuji. But also, if you look at it uh, as an archaeological site, uh, it becomes a paradigm for building accomplishments of enduring value that uh, are not just uh, short-term things. So the, the ruins have gone for, for a long time afterwards. And a business application of that that I got from my, my friends who came with us uh, to the Himalayas last year is that uh, Intelligo, which is a company here that does financial services, uh, in 2008 when the market crashed, a number of their clients had invested in a fund connected with Bernard Madoff, the, you know, who did the Ponzi scheme, the Great Pyramid Scheme, where people lost billions of dollars. And the clients were upset. They lost all their money. So they mentioned this to Intelligo, and Intelligo had no responsibility for it because the clients had bought this money, these uh, investments on their own. But under the leadership of Carlos Rodriguez Pastor and uh, Reynaldo Roizenbeet, who is here, both of whom were here, uh, they came to the conclusion that what they should do is reimburse the clients for the full value, not 50%, but the full value of their losses for the longer enduring value of establishing good long-term client relationships. One of their competitors heard about this, and uh, they only reimbursed 50%, and they got a lot of bad will as a result of that. So those are examples of some of the paradigms. And one of the things you mentioned uh, as mountains, as icons of culture, for instance, like Mount Fuji or, Mount, uh, or Machu Picchu here in, in, in Peru and Latin America, I always say that Latin America is still a very disconnected region of the world. And uh, we were talking about that before. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, these events, actually the forum events, are particularly good places to talk about it and of course to try to fix it because we can connect to the world and with the world. Um, and I have this, this perception that actually we were disconnected, that we are, um, you know, we don't trade as much, we don't get as much uh, aid or investment. And that in some ways we're also culturally isolated, much more homogeneous uh, at home, uh, you know, in a, in a world that is multicultural in so many ways, we're very, you know, Christian, even, you know, majority, mostly Catholic, but, you know, different, different types of Christianity. Um, so it, it's, to me, we're a bit um, too homogeneous, and so, and so that we're maybe less tolerant. Um, what's, what's your take on that, on, on Latin America connecting to the world and in a way Latin America connecting uh, to itself? Well, superficially, you might say Latin America seems homogeneous from the outside, but if you start to get into it, and I'm sure most of you are here aware, uh, there's a lot of diversity here. To begin with, uh, yes, on the surface it's Christian, but then particularly in a country like Peru, you have the pre-Columbian religions which are still surviving. So, for example, uh, there's a very important festival called Coyoriti near Cusco that happens in June which combines a worship of Jesus with a worship of the Apus or mountain deities. And some of the people go up and make offerings on the glacier to both Jesus and the Apu. And in terms of Catholicism, many of the pre-Columbian deities have been assimilated into uh, Catholicism as saints. Or for example, Pachamama, the earth goddess, becomes the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of examples of this. Um, so, and, and Mount, I have a colleague who's done a lot of uh, research. We did some research ourselves in Greece on sacred mountains. But he does high altitude archaeology. He discovered Juanita, the Inca ice maiden, uh, which is now, I believe, in a museum in Cusco uh, at about uh, 21,000 over 6,000 meters. And in the case of uh, <coughs> the uh, Andean communities, mountains are still invoked as worshiped as sources of rain and water, which is essential. For, uh, for life. This is a very common theme. Uh, I work a lot in the Himalayas. The whole Himalayan range, for example, in Nepal is revered, among other things, as a source of water 
The word means literally the abode of snow from which the water comes. So in Latin America, you have a lot of indigenous cultures that still survive, and especially in the Selva side, in the jungle in the Amazon region. So there's an incredible diversity among them. They're not all the same. And then even in Christianity, if you're going to look at religions, you have Catholicism. But now, of course, you've got evangelical Protestantism, which is making great inroads. So there's quite a deal of diversity, religiously speaking, and culturally. And then, as I mentioned before, you have a lot of immigrants who've come here. Uh, of course, the earliest immigrants were the Spanish and the Portuguese. But now you have people from Japan, uh, Europe, uh, all over the world have come here. In addition to which, I think Latin America, for one of the reasons that the Peruvian economy is booming, is because of trade with Asian countries like China. So there's, uh, there's no longer an isolation. And in order to do this, this kind of trade and to recognize other leadership styles, uh, you need to become aware of what it is that motivates people in these other cultures. Uh, so one of the themes of this conference is basically uh, change that's coming not only economically uh, but socially. And I think what's really important for this is you're going to need leadership which is flexible, able to look at different points of view, and is also tries to cover as much as possible the full range of possibilities. So that's why using different peak paradigms, the metaphor then is a whole range of peaks. There's a whole range of values and approaches and ways of thinking about leadership that will be very important for the future of Latin American development, both socially, environmentally, and economically. And so how do you see us connecting to the world? Uh, you, you've traveled around the world, climbing mountains, among other things. Um, and what, what do you think we can learn, for instance, from, from the East? I mean, the other, of course, uh, the icon is Everest. And right. you mentioned the, the Himalayan culture. Yeah. and the, yeah. Well, let me give you an example from uh, what we do on our, on our leadership treks in the Himalayas. Uh, we started off doing it for graduates, mid-career graduates of the Wharton Executive MBA program. Now, these are very type A people who are very competitive, very driven. We take them out in the Himalayas on a trip like this. And you can do the same thing here in Peru. And the amazing thing happens. They all become very cooperative. And they start to bond and develop uh, ways of interacting with each other uh, that they really relate to, but they need to know, but they haven't really practiced uh, back home. So that's one thing. Uh, for example, there's an, a, a style of Asian leadership, which is reflected in Taoism, which is, from their point of view, a leader leads best when people hardly know he or she is leading. And people say, we did it themselves. So often we think here, well, you know, the leader has to be the caudillo, the big leader who gets all the attention. Well, often you motivate people much more if they get, you know, personal responsibility and get credit for what they're doing, and then there's a lot more buy-in. Uh, that's an Asian idea, which is very useful that can be used in, in many different cultures. So there are a number of examples like this. So should we start climbing mountains in, oh, no, well, with I, our teams? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, when we go in the Himalayas, we don't climb, well, we walk up a peak. We don't do anything technical. And I should confess that when I was young, I did a lot of climbing. And I got into dangerous situations, although I'm a very cautious person. But I haven't climbed in years. What I found was when I went to Nepal, living there, I got more interested in walking through the mountains and being there. And to me, the fullest metaphor, and I'll give a number of presentations on peak paradigms for business groups. And I'll deal with the different mountains. But the final one, or near the final one, is what I call the mountain journey. Because if you look at the full course of an organization or a person's life, it's not just going up a mountain or even around a mountain, which is a practice that's done. It's basically a series of ups and downs. It's really a horizontal journey with ups and downs on the way. So you attain a goal, and then you come down the other side into a valley, and you go up over another ridge. And this is basically the progress of an organization. And one of the insights you get from mountain climbing is that the most dangerous part of a climb is the descent. That's where you've lost focus, motivation. The same sort of thing happens in business. You, know, you work very hard to attain a goal. You get it. Everybody says, ah, we've gotten it. Now they sort of get tired. Uh, they start to make mistakes. And the critical thing for a leader is a leader is going to have to lead through those valleys to get to the next mountain. How does he or she do that? That's really the... Uh, the real critical test of leadership, not when things are going really well and you're all excited. And we were talking on how these multiple, now we talk about multiple bottom lines, triple bottom lines, double bottom lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were also talking about how in the past you had maybe kind of ensured your, your, the, some commitment from your team 
Whereas today, more and more, we, we have to drive young professionals to our companies and to our organizations. We need to keep them motivated. So this analogy seems particularly fitting to these, te these times. Like when you, you have to not only get to the goal like one time, but rather mm -hmm. keep coming to it, but also building something in the process. Right, and the process, if you focus just on the goal, you don't realize you've got a great opportunity of building a team and an enduring organization for the long term. So even if there's a failure, what can the team learn from the failure that makes them stronger? Uh, so you need to look at that as well. And we were talking about triple bottom line, and one of the, the greatest insights for me uh, in, our, in our preparation for this session was kind of a personal multiple bottom line. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in your experience, that was triggered by the avalanche experience. Uh -huh. And uh, a few of us have uh, faced the actual death, actually, at a point mm -hmm. that when I was reading you, uh, you were describing how you were dying, or so, or so you thought. And so what, why don't you tell us a little bit about that particular anecdote and how it changed okay. the way you see your own goals. Okay. Well, actually, in, in a strange sort of way, it began in Buenos Aires. My sister checked a book out of the library called Annapurna, which she thought was an adventure story about a girl named Annapurna, like Nancy Drew mystery stories in the United States. It was actually an account of the first ascent of the, one of the world's highest mountains, uh, Annapurna. And she tossed it on her bed, and I found it and became entranced by it. So uh, eventually, in Nepal, we went on an expedition to Annapurna South, one of these peaks. It's higher than Aconcagua, higher than anything outside of Asia. And what happened was there were four of us, and we were following somebody who was leading, who was much more experienced than us. And he led us directly up an avalanche runoff slope underneath what are called hanging glaciers. They come over cliffs, and the glaciers advance, and when they let go, they cause the largest avalanches you have. When this happens in the ocean, you get icebergs. In the mountains, you get enormous avalanches. So I was very uncomfortable with this. I knew it was very dangerous, and I looked up, and one of these glaciers shattered, hung there for a moment, and then it fell away, and all of a sudden, this massive cloud blew up with chunks of ice on it, roaring down on us. It was the most powerful thing I'd ever experienced. Uh, it sounded like a thousand thunderstorms. We tried to run, but there was no place to hide, and it stopped. And it was a beautiful day all around me. As far as I knew, you, did not, you didn't survive an avalanche like this with the ice. And it just hit me with absolute certainty, you're going to die. And I just stopped, and I looked around, and it looked as though the mountains were around me as if they were on the screen of a movie theater that I was about to step out of. And then I gave up. I was totally freaked out. At that point, something deep within me rose up and took over. And then I found myself doing everything very smoothly, very precisely, as if I knew exactly what I was doing. But I was like, what am I doing? And I <laughs> watched myself. The avalanche hit. It was a tremendous blow. And then I was flying maybe 100 kilometers an hour. It's very hard to tell. And I was swimming in this wave of snow and ice and air. Things were hitting me, and I couldn't understand why I was swimming, because I was convinced I was going to get crushed to death at any moment by a block of ice. This went on for a long time. I can't tell you how long. But I went maybe 300 meters down this uh, gentle slope. And then the avalanche came to a stop. It had picked up powder snow, which you know was fluffy. Well, what I discovered was uh, when an avalanche stops with powder snow, it sets like concrete. And I'd lost my mittens. Uh, my hands were bare. I couldn't even wiggle my fingers. The snow was so hard. And what was worse was I couldn't breathe. And to me, that was the most horrible way to go. And I was very panicky. And then for some reason, uh, all of a sudden, an extraordinary calm came over me. And I saw there was nothing to be afraid of. Death was literally not anything at all. There was nothing there to be afraid of. It was a matter of becoming part of the world around me. And I started to go into it. And as I did, all of a sudden, one of my hands, completely on its own, no direction from me, went bang. And I had an airspace and could breathe. So then I started thinking, you know, there are three of us. The others must be dead. Nobody's going to come looking for us. I can't wait for somebody to dig me out, because nobody's going to dig me out. I either get out or I die. And I started wiggling around, and I couldn't make any headway. I jumped to the conclusion I was pinned under a block of ice. And I remembered in the avalanche reading an account of a French climber who chiseled his way out with a pocket knife and a piton, a climbing spike in the Alps. But I was up at twice the altitude in the Himalayas with much less oxygen. So I thought, well, now I'm going to freeze to death. There were a whole bunch of different ways of dying that presented themselves. And so I got panicky again. Uh, I was in a diving position, so just my boots were sticking out. Uh, but people have uh, suffocated to death being buried much less deeply than that at lower altitudes. 
And uh, the calm came again, then all of a sudden my body went bang. And I popped out, sort of like a cork out of a bottle. And then I was standing up. And I went over, and my friend upstream, who was OK, he was buried from the waist down, and he couldn't get out. He said, dig. And I said, I can't. My hands are frozen. And so I was kicking at his legs. And I wasn't kicking very hard, afraid of gashing him with my crampons, spikes on my boots. But there was a big boom, and another glacier broke off, and another avalanche came toward us. And I tried to run. Uh, not that I would have gotten very far, but the rope had gotten tangled around my legs, so I couldn't take a step. And that time, I was just so exhausted. All I could do was look at the avalanche and think, my god, after all this, it's unfair. And the avalanche stopped right next to us and covered us with dust. So then I kicked like hell, and we got him out, and we came down. So there were some lessons uh, that I developed that were very important for leadership that I also use in my talks. The first one, which is not as important, is we often assume that somebody who is experienced has good judgment. That's not always the case. The person who led us into the avalanche was very experienced. He'd made the first winter ascent of Mount McKinley, the highest peak in Alaska, but he went straight up where he shouldn't have gone. So you've got to look at experience and judgment when you're looking at leadership. The second one took a number of years to develop, and it really has that triple thing that you're talking about, which is in the middle of the night after the avalanche, I woke up, and for the first time on the entire expedition, I felt like climbing the mountain just for the sheer joy of climbing it. Up till then, I'd been trying to climb the mountain to attain an objective, to make up for things that had gone wrong, and it had been a very grim sort of experience. Well, we couldn't. I lost everything, and we had to go down. But over the years, what I've learned is, and it took me quite a while to learn this, was that when I do things for the joy of doing them, that's when I do them best. That's when also uh, I feel most fulfilled in doing them, and when I have the best effect on others. So the conclusion I've drawn from leadership is a very effective way of leading is if a leader can take joy in what he or she is doing and communicate that to the people that they're leading so that they enable the people who are following them or in their organization to fulfill themselves at the same time as they fulfill their goals. And uh, I found a great example of this in business in the United States. Clifton Wharton, not the Wharton School, but Clifton Wharton, took over TIA CREF, which is a huge pension fund in the United States, and he had to restructure it, which was a, a mammoth job. And what he said about the job, which was very difficult, was, I was having a ball, a wonderful time. Sometimes hard to imagine. How would you advise us to, to get to that, short of an avalanche? Because I personally won't, won't try to get up there, or, you know, I thought the first lesson was going to be, don't do that. Uh -huh. but, uh, but short of that, I mean, how, how would us do, do, would do something like that? We tend to get trapped into day-to-day -day, right. uh, responsibilities, our own goals. Uh, maybe they're not as mm -hmm. multiple bottom mm -hmm. lines as may, they should be. So what would be a way if you would advise us to find our multiple goals and our multiple dimensions? Well, first of all, you might ask the question that's asked, why climb mountains? The most famous answer for that is because it's there. George Mallory <laughs> gave before he disappeared on Everest. Well, you have to ask a second question. What is there for you? And so in addition to attaining a goal or the bottom line, what is it that you're doing? You know, what is it that really excites you and that you're passionate about in what you're doing? And really think about that. Uh, because after the avalanche, at first I thought it was a total failure. And then I started thinking, well, um, at that period, you know, why am I climbing mountains? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And this is the question you need to ask with whatever you're doing. Uh, and I, was, I asked myself, well, why am I doing it? And I realized I was about 23, and I was interested in getting experiences for writing and also developing a sense of identity, being at that age. And I was looking, I realized, for unusual experiences. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, surviving an avalanche like that was much more unusual than getting to the summit of even an unclimbed peak. And then that enabled me to look at the experience in a more positive way, rather than just writing it off as a failure. Given that it had happened, not that I'd go out looking for it, and that's the last thing I'd do, but if something like that has happened, what can you learn from it that inspires you? So basically, looking at your work, what it is that you know, you're really excited about, focusing on that. Another way of doing it, and there are various ways, and this is something that someone on one of our treks learned, is often we focus all our attention on the goal and we become uh, overly committed to worrying about whether or not we're going to succeed. That usually gets in the way of taking joy in what you're doing. And uh, a helpful thing to do there is 
yes, you know, keep the goal in mind, but don't worry so much about whether you succeed or fail and focus more on what you're doing in the moment, putting it in a larger context. And that often, and finding what's exciting and interesting in what you're doing now that you can communicate to others. So there are a variety of ways to do this. Well, it's amazing how, we, how time flies when one is, one is having fun. Uh, and so we're, we're re literally running out of time. Uh, but it's an interesting, we're told so many times of things like that. But it's not until we hit a wall sometimes that we actually go back in our own cases, in our mm -hmm. own lives, and, uh, and re-examine it and, re and ask the, those questions. And so I guess it's, we should be looking for, not, not for trouble necessarily, but for ways to, uh, to face ourselves. Uh, and, and, and those around us, actually, that's perhaps even the hardest part, or harder part, because it's not only about our own, own motivation, but also those around us, what moves them, and how do we make sure that what we're doing together fulfills them as, as well. Um, it's, been, it's been, again, time flew, but it's been very interesting to discuss this in preparation and now, and I hope our, for sure our conversation will continue and also perhaps somebody else with the audience. Uh, thanks a lot for your insight and your time and your candid, how candid you were. And thanks a lot for everyone for, for coming to, to this session. Well, thank you. You've done a magnificent job with the, the discussion. Thank you.